Hello everyone. Welcome back to our weekly webinar series. My name is Faiza Hashmi. I am the tax director here at Fest Cooper. Today I've been joined by my colleague Mahar Abdul, who is the managing director. And today, together, we will be taking you through today's presentation. Uh, so every Wednesday, we have been discussing various provisions of corporate tax law. So we have started out with the basic provisions. We have covered what are resident, non-resident, taxable person, exempt persons, out of scope person, what is UE source income. We have discussed permanent establishment, application of the CT on partnership, on free zones, on family foundation and trust, how to compute the taxable income, what are deductible expenses, the different interest capping rules, unrealized gain and losses, and so on. And after that, we had moved on and discussed the cabinet, ministerial, and the federal decisions that have come out to explain these provisions more in detail. And uh, after that, we have started um, discussing the various tax guides which the FT has introduced. So we have discussed the corporate tax guide. We have discussed the tax guide on natural person, uh, the transfer pricing guide. We have discussed um, the guide on uh, um, entities that are involved in extractive and non-extractive natural resource business. And then we have been discussing the tax group guide. So if you missed any of our lecture, you can always go to our YouTube channel. They are available there. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and you can email, at, email us at info at crestcooper.com. So like I said that we have been discussing the tax proof guide. I think this is the six weeks that we have been discussing this guide. It's a very detailed guide and it is very, I think one of the important guides for any company when making a decision if they should be you know, making a tax group or not for its entities. Uh, they need to understand all the provisions and uh, FTA has done a good job of uh, you know, giving a detailed uh, instructions and guidance on all these provisions. So we have already um, discussed these nine uh, sections of the guide. So let me recap a little bit. We discussed what is a tax group. So we had seen that if two or more taxable persons, if they're meeting the conditions of Article 40 and they wish to form a tax group, uh, they will be treated as a single taxable person. We discussed that what are these conditions uh, to form this tax group under Article 40, that the company, parent company, uh, and uh, subsidies, they should be resident persons, they should be juridical persons. Uh, we've seen that the parents should have at least 95% direct or indirect ownership in the share capital, uh, 95 direct or indirect ownership in the voting rights of the subsidies. They should have 95% direct or indirect ownership in the net, uh, in the profits and the net assets of the company at time of liquidation. Uh, we have seen that uh, the person, uh, the tax group cannot uh, be a qualifying fee zone person or an exempt person. Uh, we have seen that all the members of the tax group should have been following the same accounting standards and also have the same uh, year. So um, after we have discussed this uh, conditions to form a uh, tax group, we have seen that then a uh, parent company can apply to form this tax group. And if that has been done, there are certain responsibilities that they are taking over like they need to file the tax return, they need to consolidate all the uh, financial statements, they need to eliminate the intergroup transactions, apply for refunds, make the payments, so uh, add any new members, they all come under the obligations of the parent. Uh, we've seen that if you know in a tax group you want to um, add a new member or replace the parent or so somebody needs to leave the tax group, what are the conditions what, in this life cycle of a tax group. Then we discussed uh, the chapter seven, which is on um, of what happens if we do deregistration of a tax group under what condition and what is the timeline? Uh, we also discussed the taxable income of a tax group that, you know, uh, when the elimination of the intergroup transaction takes place, what are the exception to those? And uh, what happens, you know, in the different provisions of the tax law, like when the tax rate is being applied, how to do that for the small business relief, we need to consolidate um, all the income revenue of all the, you know, members we discussed for the ownership requirement when we are doing, you know, uh, seeing different reliefs like qualifying um, uh, business relief, then how to um, ac accumulate all the ownership for participative uh, exemption, how to calculate this. Uh, we saw if we don't have 100% owned uh, subsidy, what should we do when we have to make an election? What happens? What happens, you know, if a new subsidy comes in uh, who has not made an election? What happens after the group has, you know, uh, disbanded and then if we have made any elections for unrealized gains or losses or for transitional provision, what happens for that? Um, so we all discussed this in our previous lectures in detail. And then in the last um, webinar, we had discussed 
what are the cases where attribution of the taxable income needs to be done between members of the tax group. Um, and uh, this is what I will be recapping for you today. And Mahar will be taking you through today's topic, which is on tax losses. So I believe we might need to have one more um, webinar on this guide, and then we will move on to some new topic. So like I just said that, um, you know, when a tax group, when two or more taxable person, they form a tax group, they're treated as a single taxable person. And we keep reiterating that, that they are supposed to be treated as a single taxable person. But in the guide, they are being given four cases, four situations where that will not happen, where we need to look at these members separately and uh, calculate this taxable income separately for these four countries, for these four cases. What are those cases? So if a member in a tax group has any unutilized pre-grouping tax losses. So we've seen that if you know there are any pre-grouping tax losses we discussed in our previous lectures, then those pre-grouping tax losses, the group members cannot you know, utilize that if they are pre-grouping tax losses, which a new subsidy is bringing in, and only it can be utilized, they can, they can be parked with the tax group, but they have to be utilized against the income of that particular member. Um, so that is uh, what we will be discussing in detail. Then um, another situation where we can we have to look at this um, ta this at uh, taxable income separately would be to claim a foreign tax credit if one of the tax group members has earned income in which a foreign tax credit is available to be utilized. Then if there is any benefit which is available to any member under Article 22G, uh, any incentive uh, provided by the minister, then that has to be seen separately. And if there are any pre-grouping net interest expense, then that also, uh, if a member has any unutilized uh, at the time when they join the tax group, that has to be looked at separately as well, just like the pre-grouping tax loss. <clears throat> so let's take this example. For sorry. So let's take the example for this unutilized pre-grouping losses. So if there is any unutilized pre-grouping losses, they can, there are two conditions to be met. First of all, they can only be offset up to 75% of the group's taxable income. Second is that the, the member, since we already said that they can only be utilized against the member who has bought in these uh, pre-grouping losses. So they should, they need to have adequate taxable income to do that. So in the in our example, the group taxable income is ten thousand. The members taxable income is five thousand. Pre grouping tax losses is six thousand. So now the first condition is seventy five percent of the group taxable profit. In this case, is seven thousand five hundred. So we cannot go beyond this. So right now our pre grouping tax losses are under this amount. So this first condition is not restricting us. Then the second condition is that it can only be utilized up to uh, the members taxable income. In this case, it's five thousand. So that is only how much it can be utilized. And whatever remaining, which is thousand in this case, that needs to be carried forward. So for the second, for foreign tax credit, so the condition is that if one company has this foreign tax credit that it can claim, then that shouldn't exceed the corporate tax, which is due on the member's relevant income. And this foreign tax credit, it cannot be carried forward or back like the losses. So, for example, the tax losses can be carried forward indefinitely. The net interest expenditure can be carried forward for 10 years, but for foreign tax credit, it cannot be carried forward at all. So, in our example, the member's foreign tax credit that is available for utilization is 2,500. Member's taxable income is 400,000. So, first, we will calculate the corporate tax uh, that is up to 375 would be 0%, and then 9% on remaining 25,000, which is in this case 2,000 to 50. So the foreign tax credit that is utilized in this case would be 2,250 and the remaining 250, that cannot be carried forward or claimed or carried back. So this cannot be refunded and it is basically lost. Um, for the pre-grouping net interest, again, just like the uh, tax losses, we have to look at the group, the whole group, uh, um, you know, EBITDA and uh, the 12 million that we will calculate. So the condition for the pre, uh, net interest expenditure that can be realized, which is 30% of the tax group EBITDA or the 12 million that will be looked as a tax uh, group as a whole, not individual company. Uh, and then the member, of course, then should have sufficient taxable income, just like for the uh, losses. So let's take an example. If the tax group EBITDA is 10 million, member's taxable income is 1 million and pre-grouping net interest expense is 2.5 million. So here, this 30% of EBITDA uh, or 12 million, 12 million is higher in this case. It's not restricting us because our pre-grouping net interest expense is less than this. 
uh, but the available members taxable income is 100 uh, this 1 million so we will only be able to utilize this and then the pre grouping net interest expense uh, remaining will be carried forward if this is year 1 then it can be carried forward for 9 more years if it is year 2 then it can be carried forward for remaining 8 years so up till the 10 years can be uh, it can be carried forward so now this principle of attribution, like we said, it says that we need to look at the members separately. So that goes uh, opposite to the tax group provision, which says that we need to look at the tax group as a whole. For these specific four cases, we need to be looking at the tax, uh, the tax members of the group separately. So if there have been any transactions between the members and they have been eliminated under the consolidation, then we need to look at them from the arm plan principles. If they have not been uh, eliminated, then we can take them at the same value, which have been uh, reflected in the consolidated financial statement. But if they were in, eliminated under consolidation, they need to be looked at from an arm length principle. So let's discuss what is this arm length principle. So this arm length principle basically says uh, that it requires that every transaction which are being done with the members of the tax group, if they are done below, above, or at zero value, from uh, the market value, then they need to be corrected and brought to arm's length basis, meaning that fair market value. So, for example, if company, one company in a tax group is doing a sale uh, to another company in a tax group, uh, so then we will need to see what is the price that they have uh, made the sale at. So, let's say in our example, the sale that they did to the third party was at 50 a sale that they did to one member in the tax group was 25. The sale of goods they did to the other member in the tax group was 75. So now uh, for what usually when you are selling to third party, that is considered to be at arm length, the fair market value. So we will take that as the fair market value here. And if they have made the sale under this fair market value, which is in the first member's case where it is 25, it needs to be bought back to the correct market value. If it is done above the market value, like in the second case of 75, it needs to be brought down to the corrected value of 50. So in both these cases, it needs to be corrected and brought to the arm length price. Now, if one member of the tax group is incurring any cost on behalf of another member, then it has to be transferred at market value. Any transfer of assets and liabilities between the tax group members, that can be uh, treated as taking place at no gain or loss. Uh, if a member of a tax group has an item of income of our expense that is eliminated on consolidation, another group member must have a corresponding expenditure. So if one is, uh, is uh, recognizing an income, the other needs to have a corresponding expenditure uh, between both the members. And if they don't have this corresponding uh, income or expenditure, then the relevant income and expenditure also in, in the first member's company will also not be recognized for this purpose of this attribution of taxable income. So they need to have a corresponding uh, expenditure income to both of this. Uh, when we are looking at this uh, application of the arm length standard, we need to be also be careful of that, you know, the individual group member's income should not be exceeding the group's income. This is a general uh, principle that we need to look at whenever we are applying this attribution principle. Okay, so there can be, uh, you know, certain cases where members of a tax group are loaning, uh, have lent, uh, you know, given loans to each other. So in that case, if a member of a tax group has given an interest bearing loan to another member of a tax group, what will happen is that one group member is going to record the interest income, which will increase the taxable income for the lender, right? And one is going to record the interest expense, which will reduce the taxable income. So for the borrower, it will reduce the taxable income. For the lender, it will increase the taxable income. So in this case, uh, the, in the general interest deduction rule and the specific interest deduction rule, they will be considered in the case for the borrower company, we will be considering this. Um, these uh, uh, provisions will apply to that also. So now if uh, these uh, under these interest deduction rule, if any limitation has been applied, so for example, if it is, uh, if their interest that they are taking the deduction for is over the 30% of a bit or 12 million, and this deduction limitation has applied in the case of the borrower. So then if they have restricted the interest in the books, then the lender will also need to reverse the corresponding interest income in their records. So usually for third parties, uh, interest deduction, we are, you know, uh, it is not um, needed to make any adjustments, but only in one case we will be making this adjustment if the interest deduction is also restricted for the tax book. Only in that case we will make for third party. Now, if a member has given a loan to another member of the tax group, it could be that later that they have impaired this uh, 
loan receivable in their books. So this uh, normally if one company is doing the impairment, it does not result in a corresponding income for the buyer, only for the lender they are impairing this uh, loan receivable. So this, in this case, this deduction, we will not consider it uh, because it does not have a corresponding uh, income expense, right? So for when we are calculating taxable income of the individual group member, we will not consider this. So in another case could be when the lender basically records an impairment of interest receivable on a loan that they have given in the tax book. If this happens, then we will consider that this has happened after the initial recognition of the interest income in the books. The lender will need to recognize both the interest income and the impairment of interest receivable in this book. Even if it has been netted off in the financial statement, they have to do this. Because as a result, if the interest expense is recognized by the borrower on a standalone basis, this expenditure will first reduce the attribution of taxable income for borrower and corresponding income would increase the attribution of taxable income to lender. So lender's taxable income will increase and the borrower's taxable income will reduce because of this. So it could also happen that the lender might reverse a loan, which uh, uh, a loan impairment that they have made in the book, they might be reversing this transaction. This will not affect the borrower's record and it will not be, be taken into consideration except for the case where unless the member of the tax group uh, have acknowledged a deductible loss associated with that loan before they were part of the tax group, they had a deductible loss that is associated with this loan. So only in that case, we will consider it. Otherwise, it will not be considered. So if a lender waives a loan, then what happens? So if you are waiving a loan, basically this usually will result in the borrower having you know, an income because of the cancellation of this obligation, they don't have to pay back this loan anymore. It has been waived by the lender. So this income will be evaluated in the lender's record on an arm length basis we will need to see and up to the extent of any loss reported by the lender in the corresponding tax period. And if the lender has not reported any loss, then the income will not be considered in this case. Uh, I will now hand it over to Mahar, who will take you through the topic of today and will discuss the um, tax losses and how you can utilize it in specific order. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Thank you very much, Faiza, for giving very detailed somehow summarized introduction again, once again, for the recapping all previous lectures related to the tax group. We are discussing to the tax group how the tax group can utilize the losses in the specific order. As further discussed, that the group can carry forward, sorry, the group can adjust maximum 75% of their taxable income, of their taxable profits. So, minimum, the group will be liable to pay tax on the 25% of their taxable income. 75% they can adjust. But this adjustment of the 75% of their taxable income against the losses, 75% can be adjusted, remaining 25% can be carried forward for unlimited period of time. But it is this is subject to two conditions. These two conditions are very important. These two conditions are the first condition is there should be a continuity of ownership. And if there is no continuity of ownership, then there should be a continuity of business. These two conditions, these two conditions, any of these conditions must be satisfied. Either it should be a continuity of ownership. If there is no continuity of ownership, there should be a continuity of business. And this continuity should start before the incurring of the loss until the adjustment of the loss. If these two conditions are being satisfied from the point the loss is incurred till the point the losses has been adjusted, then we can adjust up to 75% of the taxable income of the group. Remaining 25% will be subject to tax. Now the question arises, the important question, and in this question is, can a group adjust 100% of the losses? These losses can be, first of all, these losses can be of different categories. These losses can be pre-grouping losses. We'll discuss what is pre-grouping losses. These losses can be, these losses can be restricted tax group tax losses. These losses can be group itself losses after joining of the subsidiary. These losses can be transfer losses. Four different types of losses can be there. So the question is, 
Again, fifth can be there also if there are transfer of going concern. So these losses needs to be adjusted and these losses needs to be adjusted in the specific order. We'll look into the order in which order these losses needs to be adjusted. Second question is, will these losses be adjusted 100% against the taxable income? Well, there are special rules related to this as well. We need to look into this. So the first thing, as I mentioned, the group provides relief of tax losses in corporate tax, allowing businesses to offset these losses against the future taxable income. And this will be subject to 75% of their taxable income. 75% of the group taxable income you can adjust. 75% of the group taxable income you can adjust, remaining 25% will be subject to tax. This adjustment is subject to two important conditions. One is the continuity of the ownership. Second is the continuity of the business. This should be from the point losses incurred till then the losses were satisfied. So what is continuity of ownership? The law says there should not be more than 50% change in the ownership from the time losses were incurred until they were adjusted. And this requirement applies at the parent level. Parent will be at the top 95% holding for the group. We all know this 95% holding for the group. This at the parent level, they should not be more than 50% change in the ownership. If there is a more than 50% change in the ownership, then we will assume that the continuity of the ownership condition has not been satisfied. Now, if the continuity of the ownership condition has not been satisfied, then the law says then you need to apply the second condition. This second condition is continuity of the business. So continuity of the business, the law says the group utilizing the same assets as they did before any change in the ownership. The first, second thing they are asking, they are not any fundamental identity or operations of the business has been changed. So first, the same assets are being utilized by the group before changing the ownership. Second, second, then not any fundamental change in the identity and operations of the business. Third thing, the loss is if there are any changes, these related to these must be related to the assets of the business services, processes, products and methods that existed prior to the change in ownership. So if all these conditions are being satisfied, if these conditions are being satisfied, then we can say that there is a continuity of business. So the two conditions, first continuity of ownership, if this continuity of ownership is not being met, then we need to look into the continuity of business. If there is a continuity of ownership or if there is a continuity of business, then the tax group can adjust up to 75% of their taxable income in the form of losses. Now the losses, as I discussed, there will be different types of losses. This will be pre-grouping losses. Group losses, in the group losses, there can be restricted group losses. There can be non-restricted group losses. There can be transfer losses, business restructuring relief losses. Pre-grouping losses, just look into this. There is a one group, A and B. The one group, assuming in 2024, this is the one group. This group has some losses, assuming 100,000. One new entity is joining this group, C. This is the subsidiary. This is the only reason that this subsidiary can join the tax group. Basically, the parent company will have 95% holding. If there is a 95% holding, then only subsidiary will be able to join the group. So assuming this subsidiary has some losses of 50,000. So this 100,000 losses of the tax group before joining of the subsidiary, this is called restricted group tax losses. These are my restricted group tax losses. This subsidiary is joining the tax group so the time subsidiary is joining the tax group, this is called pre-grouping tax losses. The tax losses of the subsidiary before joining the tax group, these are called pre-grouping tax losses. The tax losses of the group before joining of the subsidiary, these are called restricted group tax losses. Now the group is A, B, C assuming. Because A, B was the initial group, C has joined the group, now the group A, B, C. This group can make losses as well, assuming 150,000. We'll look into the example. So these losses, 150,000, these are non-restricted group losses. 
law is silent about this word specifically non restricted group losses i have used this word law is using two words guide is using two words guide is using pre grouping losses restricted group losses i am assuming if the group losses are other than restricted group losses there is non restricted group losses the group can have one more loss as well these are the transport losses we know this there is a 75% ownership if there is a 75% common ownership and all rest of the conditions are being satisfied then the one taxable person can transfer their losses to another taxable person so might be there is a possibility another member is d d has transferred the loss to a b c d this group can have a transfer losses as well the primarily four losses pre grouping losses restricted group losses non restricted group losses transfer losses another in business restructuring relief the treatment will be same this is the transfer of going concern we will be discussing four important losses pre grouping losses non restricted group losses restricted group losses and transfer losses so pre grouping losses as i discussed earlier when a subsidiary joins a new tax group the subsidiary can have the losses these losses are called the pre grouping tax losses so law the guide as well as the law is very clear regarding this so once this group has been made the structure of the group initially it was a plus b now c overall this is a b c losses the losses pre grouping losses of c in our previous slide we said this will be 100000 this 100000 cannot be adjusted against the taxable income of the whole group against this group income cannot be adjusted but it can be adjusted against the taxable income of the c if c has made any taxable income after becoming a part of the tax group this 50000 can be adjusted against the taxable income of the c provided this adjustment should not be more than 75% of the taxable income of the group and it should not be more than 50000 sorry it should not be more than actual taxable income of c so the condition is basically we'll discuss the conditions as well for the pre grouping losses it can be adjusted against the taxable income of the subsidiary it cannot be adjusted against the taxable income of the group so pre grouping losses can be adjusted against the taxable income of the subsidiary and the condition is it should not be it should be lower the amount should be lower of the 75% of the taxable income of the group or actual taxable income of the subsidiary these losses can be adjusted 75% of the taxable income of the group and actual taxable income of the subsidiary whichever is lower these losses can be adjusted against the taxable income of the subsidiary till the subsidiary will remain part of the group this will be the rule to adjust the losses of the subsidiary once the subsidiary is leaving the tax group if there are still any pre grouping losses the subsidiary can carry forward those losses individual capacity but if the group has any losses subsidiary will not be able to carry forward those losses so these are the rules for the pre grouping tax losses we will discuss in detail in our next slides in the examples the next is restricted tax group tax losses again this is a, a and b group structure there is a c this is overall group a b c this group as we discussed in our previous slide they have restricted tax losses of 100000 now the guide and law says restricted tax losses of 100000 it cannot be adjusted against the taxable income of the group means this 100000 cannot be adjusted against the taxable income of abc cumulative taxable income there are conditions condition is the rule is basically 75% of the taxable income lower of the following 75% of the taxable income of the group or 75% of the taxable income of the members before joining the subsidiary so 75% taxable income of abc 75% of the taxable income of a and b lower of this up to lower of this 
so the taxable income of a and b compulsory to adjust the restricted tax group losses for the subsidiary income of c was compulsory for the restricted tax group losses income of pre joining of the subsidiary group members a and b income is compulsory against with the income against the losses restricted tax group losses of the group before the joining of the subsidiary will be adjusted and remaining in case the same principle applicable for the group as well in case they wanted to separate it if they have any losses it will be carried forward by the a and b otherwise it will not be adjusted against the taxable income of the group the rule is basically 75 percent of the taxable income of the group or 75 percent of the taxable income of the members before joining of the subsidiary lower of this it will be adjusted transfer of losses as we discussed earlier the, the possibility that the qualifying group qualifying group we know the conditions the juridical person the 75 percent holding same accounting period same financial period consistent accounting policies all these conditions are there the important condition is the 75 percent holding so if this is a company A, company B, A, B, C, this is a qualifying group. In this qualifying group, if one member of the company, company B is transferring to C, or there is a possibility that they are part of the VAT with a group, one more group inside it as well. B is transferring to another member of the tax group. So if the transfer of losses, one, I think this is Article 38 of the law. If there is a transfer of losses, basically, the transfer of losses, will be adjusted by the tax group as well but there are hierarchy we need to look into this what is the condition the hierarchy regarding this business restructuring leave this transfer as a going concern simple treatment basically the losses of a if this is a company a the transfer of going concern this a transferring is business to b now the losses of a will become a business losses of b the same rules will be applicable that we will discuss earlier that we will discuss earlier more provisions of the tax losses Restricted group losses cannot be utilized by the subsidiary. We have already discussed this. Within a tax group, if one member experiences the tax loss while another member generates positive taxable income, both will be consolidated and tax will be applicable on the consolidated results. If a subsidiary leaves a tax group, sorry, any associated tax will remain the group except pre-grouping unutilized tax loss that we already discussed basically. If the C has losses, C is part of the group, now the C is leaving the group. Any, if any pre-grouping tax losses will be there, C can carry those losses. In the event of a tax group dissolution, there is a possibility if the group is being dissolved, there is a possibility that the parent will be there and parent will not be there. If the parent company will be there, all the losses will be shifted to the parent company. If the parent will not remain, then these losses will be converted into unutilized losses. If the parent company is being changed, already A was the parent company, now D will be the parent company, group will remain there, only the parent company change in the parent company. If the group will be there, they change in the parent company, the, all the losses will belongs to the group and the treatment will be same as well that we've already discussed. There will not be any change. Just look into this example, whatever we have discussed till now. This is very important example. And so far as the hierarchy of the losses is concerned, I can discuss very quickly what will be the hierarchy of the losses. I think I would discuss in a previous. First of all, the losses will be adjusted pre-grouping losses. Hierarchy for the adjustment of the losses, hierarchy will be first of all, it will be adjusted pre-grouping losses. The hierarchy will be first of all, it will be adjusted pre-grouping losses. This is the guide said, pre-grouping losses. Secondly, it will be adjusted restricted tax losses this is the second thing first first of all the group needs to adjust the pre-grouping losses then the group needs to adjust restricted tax group tax losses what are the pre-grouping losses what are the restricted tax group tax losses we have already discussed then third the group will discuss non sorry the group will adjust non-restricted tax losses and the fourth, the group will adjust the transfer losses. This is, and the rule for this is, rule for this is 75% of the taxable income of the group or actual taxable income, whichever is lower. Here the rule is 75% of the taxable income of the group or 75% of the taxable income of the members before joining the subsidiary. Here the rule for the, here the rule for the unrestricted is same rule. 
there is no difference basically 75 percent of the taxable income or 75 percent in both of the cases because the group will be same 75 percent of the taxable income of the group or 75 percent of the taxable income individual member because the group revenue will be group taxable income will be the consolidation of individual members so rule will be same for both of the cases transfer losses 75 percent maximum up to taxable income or actual losses will look into this so this is the rule this is a rule. I have mentioned the rule here. The rule is basically lower off. This is lower off, lower off, lower off. Lower off 75% of the pre-grouping, lower off 75% of the taxable income of the group or actual 100% actual taxable income of the subsidiary, lower of this will be adjusted first. Then restricted, this is the first. This is the second adjustment. This is the third. This is the fourth. Second is 75% of the taxable income of the group less the losses that have already been adjusted means pre-grouping losses that has already been adjusted and 75 percent of the actual taxable income of the group before joining the subsidiary only a and b in our previous example so lower of this will be adjusted remaining losses then it will be adjusted after restricted basically non-restricted losses will be adjusted rule will be 75 percent of the taxable income in both of the cases and then fourth will be Transfer losses, 75% of the taxable income of the group, less adjusted losses. Less adjusted losses means one, two, three. After adjustment of these three here, after adjustment of two here, after adjustment of one here, zero adjustment. Then 100% actual transfer loss, lower of this will be adjusted. This is a rule. Just look into this example. This is very good and very classical example. In 2024, there was a group A and B. The group made a loss of 1 million. In 2025, A and B, there were no gain, no loss. Another company C, the tax loss of the company C was 250,000. This is a group. Assuming A is a parent, B is a subsidiary. This is the part of the group. This group had made a loss. Here, this is a C. C is a subsidiary of A as well. This has made a loss of 250,000. Now, in 2026, AB, zero taxable income. C, zero taxable income. They made a group. Now, this is A, B, and C. <clears throat> the ones they made a group, overall on group, in basically, overall on group basis, there will be some certain income I have not bifurcated. On group basis, they made a loss of 200,000. Now, this 100,000 is my restricted tax group tax loss. This 250,000 is pre-grouping loss. This 200,000 is a non-restricted group loss. In 2027, the group has made a profit or you can say taxable income. 1.5 million is the taxable income of A and B. 500,000 is the taxable income of C. The total taxable income of the group is 2 million in 2027. The group has transferred losses from qualifying group company 100,000. So the four losses, this is the loss number. You can say, okay, let's start from the P. This is the loss number one. This is the two. These are three. This is the four. These four losses needs to be adjusted. On the hierarchy, first of all, it will be adjusted. This is the first. This will be adjusted second. This will be adjusted third. And this will be adjusted at four. We know the rules as well. Just look at the solution. So the first rule is 75% of the taxable income of the group or 100% actual taxable income of the subsidiary, whichever is lower. So the 75% of the taxable income of the group, the group has made a taxable income of 2 million in 2027. 75% of 2 million, 1.5 million. Actual taxable income of the subsidiary, pre-grouping losses, the, the actual tax, this subsidiary, this C is a subsidiary. It has a pre-grouping losses. Actual taxable income of the subsidiary in 2027, the current tax period is 500,000. So the subsidiary can adjust maximum lower of those two amounts. 1.5 million of 500,000, A can adjust. And lower is 500,000, the subsidiary maximum can adjust 500,000. We'll look into the next slide, how they are adjusting. Now, the restricted losses. The rule is basically 75% of the taxable income of the group. This is basically 2 million into 75% less, 
loss that had already been adjusted, actual loss. We'll look into the next slide. So this amount or 75% of the taxable income of the tax group before joining the subsidiary and this amount was 1.5 million. 1.5 million into 0.7% is 1.125 million. Lower of this, this amount maximum can be adjusted for the transfer loss. After restricted loss, we have simple rule 75% of the taxable income in both of these categories and 75% of taxable income is so 2 million less pre-grouping loss adjusted, le sorry, 2 million multiply 70, 2 million multiply 75% less pre-grouping loss adjusted, less restricted loss adjusted remaining. This remaining 75% of the taxable income of the, this will be straightforward 75% of the taxable income of the group less losses already adjusted if we need to compare it taxable income the individual party of the group taxable individual party of the group is basically 1.5 million lower of this it will be adjusted and they can adjust maximum 250,000. transfer losses 75 percent of the taxable income of the group less adjusted losses and, and then this is coming basically 50,000 50,000 actual transfer actual loss which is 100,000 lower of this can be adjusted and lower is 50,000 so for the pre-grouping losses, we have a we have capacity utilized to utilize up to five hundred thousand restricted one point one million, non-restricted two hundred and fifty thousand, and transfer losses up to fifty thousand. Look into this example. Twenty-five percent tax we need to pay. My taxable income in two thousand twenty-seven is two million. In all cases, twenty-five percent I need to pay tax. Remaining is a 75%. Losses can be adjusted maximum up to 1.5 million. Maximum 75% of a taxable income or individual party income, whatever is lower, we have already discussed. So 1.5 million maximum it can be adjusted. So for the pre-grouping losses, I have a question of 500,000. While the actual loss is pre-grouping loss is 250,000 only. So the first year, the loss adjustment is 200. I had a question of 500,000, but the actual loss is 250,000. So 100% loss had been adjusted, pre-grouping loss, 100% adjusted. Remaining taxable income is 1250. Remaining taxable income. So this 1250, the next restricted tax group loss question is 1.125 million. 1.125 million is the question, but the actual loss is only 1 million. So I can adjust up to 1.125 million. My actual loss is 1 million. So this loss will be adjusted 100% as well. So 100% 1 million has been adjusted. Remaining is 250,000. So here, non restricted tax loss, sorry, restricted tax loss has been adjusted 100% as well. The remaining taxable income is 250,000. Out of this 250,000 non-restricted tax loss, 75% of the taxable income, less adjusted loss. And 75% of the taxable income is 250,000 after adjustment of the losses, less actual 1.5 million. The question is 250,000. Maximum I can adjust up to 250,000. How much is my actual loss? 200,000. So this loss has been adjusted 100%. 100% loss has been adjusted for the this 100% loss has been adjusted for the non-restricted tax group loss has been adjusted as well. Remaining income that is available for the adjustment of losses is only 50,000. We know the rule for the transfer losses. Rule is 75% of the taxable income, less adjusted losses or actual transfer loss. Actual transfer loss is how much? Actual transfer loss is 100,000. Therefore, this available income is basically lower of this 50,000 or 100,000, 50,000. Maximum, I can adjust up to 50,000. And I have the remaining taxable income of 50,000 out of this 50,000 will be adjusted, it will become zero. So this transfer loss was 100,000. 
out of this 50,000 had been adjusted, 50,000 will be carried forward for the next period subject to the fulfillment uh, of the conditions. Now, three losses fully adjusted, one losses will be carried forward and the business will be liable to pay tax on the 25% of the taxable income. This, the two things, loss will be carried forward separately, business will be liable to pay income 25% of the taxable income. Now we need to look into this, this 25% of the taxable income is less than 375,000 or more than 305. If this is less than 375,000, 0% tax. If this is more than, this is 500,000, less 375,000, 125,000 multiply 9%. Important thing is this leverage of 375,000 is not applicable for a group on the individual entity level. This is applicable on overall group level. This is one of the basically negative aspect while entering into the tax group. So if there are 10 entities, you will have separate entity, one, two, three, each entity 375,000. But if you are going into the tax group, only one time you will be given a leverage of 375,000. Any income beyond that will be subject to tax at 9%. Quickly, I'll just look into this example. I think the example that we discussed, I have I was very, very diligent to prepare this example. And it will give you thorough understanding of the adjustment of the losses in the specific order. Now, if you are going into this example, which has been given in the guide, you will be able to go through this very quickly. There's a company A, B are in the tax group, 1st Jan 2025, A and B are both are using the Gregorian calendar year as their tax period. Company B has a pre-grouping losses of 1 million. We know the rules for the pre-grouping losses. In 2025, the tax group realized taxable income of 0.8 million. Pre-grouping losses is 1 million tax group. 0.8 million, the tax income that can be utilized as a loss is 0.4 million, the tax income that can be attributed to B is 1.2 million. This is basic attribution, the net of this point. 1.2 is the gain, taxable income, 0.4 is the loss, net impact is 0.8 million. We know the rule, rule is 75% of the taxable income of the group, taxable income of the group is 0.8 million, 0.8 million into 0.75 is 0.6 million, or actual income, actual income of subsidiary in this tax period is 1.2 million. Lower of this is so 75% of the taxable income or 75% of the taxable income of the group or actual income of the subsidiary, lower of this is 0.6 million. So pre-grouping losses can be adjusted maximum up to 0.6 million. So 1 million less 0.6 million, it will be adjusted. Remaining will be 0.4 million. This 0.4 million can be carried forward. So taxable income of tax point the ability of tax group to, sorry. Uh, to utilize the pre-grouping losses is 0.6 million. This is what we've already discussed, semi restricted and the company B can be attributed to company B, which is AD, AED should be 0.4 million, 1.2, which is 1.2 million, the pre-grouping losses can be utilized. Yes, this is what we discussed. They can utilize up to 0.6 million. Taxable income of the group is, uh, taxable income of the group is, sorry, taxable income of the group is 0 0.8 million, 0 0.6 million utilized, 0 0.2 million will be group taxable income, but the subsidiary has still pre-grouping losses, 0.4 million that they can adjust it in the future. Next example is transferred of losses and multiple pre-grouping tax losses. Very good example, this one as well. So A and B are seen in a tax group, 1st Jan 2025. All three companies using the Gregorian calendar as per their accounting period. B has a pre-grouping losses of 1 million. C has a pre-grouping losses of 0.8 million. These are the pre-grouping losses in 2024. In 2025, they have made a group and the group is A, B, C. Here, the pre-grouping losses of A and B only. In 2025, tax group, in tax loss, tax loss 0.3 million, tax group. But the, in, in 2026, these tax loss is non-restricted, non-restricted tax loss. This is not a restricted tax loss because this tax loss, the group is incurring after entering, after becoming part of the tax group. In 2020, the, the group realized taxable income of 2 million. Now the taxable income in 2020 attributed as follows. This is the attribution. 2.2 million less 2 million is net 2 million. Now, the tax loss of tax group can only be utilized after utilizing the pre grouping tax losses. The first thing they need to adjust the pre grouping tax losses. And the rule is 75% of taxable income of the group or actual taxable income of the 
subsidiary in the current period. So 75% of the taxable income of the group, 75% of the taxable income, the tax, but total taxable income, so total income of the group is 2 million into 75%. So 2 million into 0.75, 1.5, maximum they can adjust up to 1.5. Our actual taxable income and the actual taxable income is, actual taxable income of B and C is 2.2 million. Actual taxable income is 2.2 million and 75% of the taxable income is 1.5 million. Lower of this is 1.5. So maximum 1.5 can be adjusted for the pre-grouping losses. How much of the losses they have? They have the losses of 1.8 million. Losses are 1.8. They can adjust maximum up to 1.5. They cannot adjust even 100% of the pre-grouping losses. Remaining loss of 0.3 will be carry forward. Now, they need to adjust B first or C first. We have already discussed it all depends upon the parent because if there are multiple pre-grouping losses, the loss is it, it is up to the discretion of the parent which losses they wanted to adjust first. So at the end, pre-grouping losses will be carry forward of 0.3 million because 1.8 less 1.5.3 million and the group, the total taxable income is 2 million. The adjusted is maximum 1.5 million. The remaining, sorry, so, so the remaining will be subject to here. You can go through this. Utilize the pre-grouping losses. Therefore, the tax is sufficient taxable and utilize the pre-grouping tax losses. B or C that attributed to B and C is sufficient to utilize the pre-grouping losses of such entities. Income attributed to B and C. Income is sufficient, but the ceiling is 75% of the taxable income. Keep in mind. However, after utilizing the pre-group on either company B or C, there will not be sufficient taxable income to the tax group to utilize other pre-grouping losses of other company. The group tax group chooses to utilize all pre-grouping losses B or only 1.5 million of C. So they can adjust full of B or portion of C or full of C or portion of B. It all depends upon the parent company we have already discussed. The parent company group would decide the pre-grouping losses to be utilized. How the pre-grouping losses to be utilized, it all depends upon the parent company. After utilizing pre-grouping losses, the group has exhausted its capacity to utilize other losses. Yes, maximum they can utilize up to 5, 1.5, 1.5 million. Pre-grouping losses are 1.8 million. So remaining will be 0.3 million. This 0.3 million, they will carry forward for future adjustment. Just look into the third example. This example is carrying a restricted tax group tax losses. I have taken it from the guide. Company A parent and company B a subsidiary are in a tax group starting from 1st Jan 2024. We have five minutes only. We are going to wind it up quickly in five minutes. A and B are in a tax group as of 1st Jan 2024. 1st Jan 2024, they are in a tax group. A hold the, all the shares in C and D as well. All four companies are using Gregorian calendar year as per the tax period. In 2024, the tax group incurred tax losses of 1 million. These 1 million losses are of A and B in 2024. In 2020, company C incurred tax loss 0.6 million. C is also company there. This is not part of the group. The loss of C is 0.6 million. In 1st Jan 2025, CD joined the tax group. Here they made. Here this was A and B. Here it was C. Here it has become A plus B plus C plus D. Here is a tax group. This was 2024. This was 2024. This is 2025. So these are pre-grouping losses. These are restricted tax group losses. And this is the taxable income of the group in 2024. There is no non-restricted tax group losses in this question, in this illustration. This is the breakup of 1.6 million. Rule is very simple. 75% of the taxable income. First of all, we need to adjust pre-grouping losses. 75% of the taxable income of the group. 75%. 1.6 multiplied 75%. Or the actual taxable income of the subsidiary in the current period subsidiary C actual taxable income is 1 million 1 million so 1.6 million 
1.2 मिलियन और 1 मिलियन लोअर ऑफ दिस इज 1 मिलियन मैक्सिमम प्री ग्रुपिंग लॉसेस कैन बी एडजस्टेड अप टू 1 मिलियन हाउ मच आर द लॉस 0.6 मिलियन सो 100% प्री ग्रुपिंग लॉसेस हैज बीन एडजस्टेड वंस द 100% ऑफ द प्री ग्रुपिंग लॉसेस हैज बीन एडजस्टेड द क्वेश्चन वाज हाउ मच वाज द क्वेश्चन क्वेश्चन द लॉ बेसिकली 1.6 मिलियन इज द टोटल टैक्सेबल इनकम up to this total taxable income 1.6 million we can adjust maximum 0.75 sorry yeah, for, so 1.6 million out of this 0.6 million has been adjusted in the form of pre grouping losses now we need to apply the second rule the second rule is restricted tax group tax losses for the restricted tax group tax losses the rule is 75% of the taxable income of the tax group which is 1.2 million or or so we need to adjust this sorry 1.2 million less the adjusted losses which is 0.6 million remaining losses is 0.6 available income for adjustment 0.6 million or 75% of the taxable income of the members of the tax group before joining the subsidiary and that is a and b due to a tax group so 1.1 million 1.1 million multiply 75% so this is 1.1 million multiply 0 0.75 0 0.825 0.825 or 0.6 million whichever is lower 0.6 million is lower so maximum 0.6 million we can adjust for the restricted tax group tax losses total tax losses are 1 million restricted tax group tax losses now we can adjust only up to 0.6 million remaining will be carry forward so just look into the solution as pre grouping tax losses would need to be utilized before restricted tax group tax losses could be utilized it should first be ass assessed to what extent the pre grouping losses can be utilized the rule is 75% of the taxable income of the group or actual taxable income of the subsidiary whichever is lower so 1.2 million or 1 million whichever is lower lower is 1 million 1 million this is the question the actual loss is only how much is the actual loss only 0.6 million so once this 0.6 million will be adjusted remaining will be 0.4 million here they have mentioned resulting in taxable income of company c resulting in a taxable income of company c 0.5 million it has been given in the guard but i believe it should have been 0.4 million you can look into this once again as well because the taxable income of company C is 1 million out of this pre grouping losses has been adjusted of 0.6 million. So 1 million less 0.6 million remaining taxable income of company C would have been 0.4 million instead of 0.5 million given in the guide. You can look into this. Now restricted tax group tax losses. We know the rules. 75% of the tax income of the tax group less losses has already been adjusted. So 75% of the taxable income of the tax group. Taxable income of the tax group is 1.6 million. 1.6 million multiply 75%. This is 1.6 multiply 7, 1.2 million out of this. <laughs> Adjusted losses are only 0 0.6 million, so remaining 0 0.6 million, as we discussed, are 75 percent of the taxable income of the tax group before joining the subsidiary. And before joining the subsidiary, the income was uh, this was 1.1 million, so 1.1 million, 1.1 million into 75 percent, 1.1 into 75, it will be 0 0.825. Lower is 0 0.6 million, so 0 0.6 million is the question. So how much is the restricted tax group tax loss? Restricted tax group tax loss is 1 million. It has been given here. So 0 0.6 million has been adjusted. So once the 0.6 million, this has been adjusted out of the remaining will be 0.4 million that will be carried forward. I believe everybody will be clear regarding the adjustment of losses. How can we adjust the losses? What is the hierarchy of adjusting the losses? What are the pre grouping losses? What are the restricted tax group tax losses? How, what is the criteria to adjust the losses? 
how can we carry forward for how much time we can carry forward all these question might be it will be in your mind i believe it has been sorted out right now so if you still have any question you can approach me you can approach faiza you can approach shahid anwar of any of our team member we are always here to help you we are always ready to listen you ready to understand ready to deliver you can drop us an email or you can give us a call thank you very much I really appreciate your time so i think i have one question sorry to say you are moving too fast i believe i just gone through your message but the important thing is that we have always very limited time if you still have any questions you can approach me directly it's fine no problem at all thank you very much thank you if you still guys you have any question you are most welcome no question All right, guys, take care and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the video. Click on the bell and subscribe to the YouTube channel.